past 14 years in IBM storage and currently works with a number of important federal government agencies. Jack has been with the DS8880 family since their release in 2005 and has a long working knowledge with these systems. Jack, welcome and go ahead and take it away. We'll give you control here. Okay, thank you, Sam. Well, I'm excited to be here today because we got some really interesting things going on, uh, not only with the DS8880, but it, it has fundamental implications across the whole storage industry. So let's dive in and see what we got. Um, so working with me today will be Jason Peopleman, who will be doing a demo here shortly uh, as I wind up with the slides. And also uh, taking questions and answers, helping with that is Brian Sherman. So uh, Jason, Brian, thank you to both of you. So let's get in and talk about the 8880 release 8.2. First, I'd like to kind of put a background on this. What the main focus of this announcement is all about is, is uh, the IBM DS8000 use of flash memory. Now, we've had varieties of flash memory in use in the DS8000 line for some time now, actually since the days of the DS8100 and DS8300. And at that time, we started using SLC memory. From then, we've moved on now to MLC memory. Other parts of IBM, such as the Deep Flash 150, are using TLC memory. So for variety, the flash memory can come in a variety of forms. Uh, now, let's go to the next slide here and take a look at how the taxonomy breaks down of offerings. In fact, the IBM DS8000, the 8880 in particular, fits into all of these categories. So in terms of flash offerings, we have more than the DS8880, but I'm going to concentrate on that in this particular presentation. Uh, we have the ability to do a hybrid flash array in which you have mixed solid state drives, solid state drives being flash in a disk format, so it fits in the existing slots for disk in the system. We have uh, custom flash um, uh, topologies in there, uh, such as the IBM flash system. Um, and we have, in particular in the DS8880, we have the high-performance flash enclosure now Gen 2. We've had the Gen 1 before, and now we're going to the Gen 2. In terms of all flash arrays, we can have all SSD, which is, again, flash in a, uh, in a disk format, or we can have custom flash hardware. In our particular case, it is the high-performance flash enclosure, too. Now, you might reasonably ask, oh, are we just using the IBM flash system? Are we just putting that into our system? No, we are not, in fact. Um, certainly nothing wrong with the flash system itself. It, it is absolutely the flash, fastest storage that's out there. Um, however, the way it's packaged, it has a controller as part of the hardware. Well, we have our own controller, or actually two controllers in the DS8000, both Power 8, very capable Power 8 processors. Um, the flash system itself, although extremely fast, does not do things like point-in-time copy and remote replication and, and many other things, whereas the DS8000 has to do all of those things. So we are using our own controller rather than using the flash system controller. So since we're using our own controller, we have um, our own back-end storage. And we'll show you in a minute what that looks like in the high-performance flash enclosure now Gen 2. So going to the next slide here, uh, why are people very excited about flash? Well, first of all, obviously you get great performance with it. And not only you get great performance with it, you get great performance with fewer devices. So I don't have to have, say, the maximum of 1,536 drives, which you can get in a DS8000 these days. I can actually get that kind of performance using a lot fewer hard drives, or, I'm sorry, sorry, flash drives. And with that, what I can do then, I can reduce my floor space. I can reduce the energy consumption. For point number three, I can drive the CPUs of servers harder. And the reason I can do that is they're no longer waiting for a response to come back. Since I'm getting such great performance out of this, not only the quantity of IOs per second, but also the latency is much better. You can see that we can drive the servers harder, which allows us then, instead of maybe 100 servers, maybe only need 10 servers, right? So we get a collapse in floor space utilization with that. Because I now have fewer old servers, that means I need fewer software licenses, so I reduce the cost. Since I'm managing fewer things and I'm using less energy, I have lower operating and administrative cost. And last, I have better reliability in this. The spinning disk is great as they are, been around for a long time. They're a mechanical device. Eventually, they wear out. Flash will eventually wear out, too, but it's not a mechanical device, electronic device. And the wear out on these is much, much longer than what you would get 
and the reliability much, much better than, you, than something based on a mechanical device such as a hard drive. So going to the next slide, I would like to point out that we're really at a very important time here in the history of storage. So IBM invented the disk drive back in 1956. And ever since that date, what has been the king of fast storage has been disk drives. Now we are finally coming to the point here where flash is starting to take over. And you can see in this IDC study, it shows that in their estimation, um, all flash will continue to grow over time. The amount of all hard drives will continue to drop and hybrid combinations of flash and hard drives will begin really to take over as the predominant. Now, I have to tell you, it's really a very exciting time now because what we believe is going to happen is in 2017, based on our projections of what we've sold so far this year, 2017 will be the first year that we will ship more capacity on flash on the DS8000 than we ship in hard drives. So a very exciting time to be in the storage industry. So the next slide, I'm going to go through uh, five different points here on the uh, DS8000 uh, release 8.2 announcement. First, the high performance flash enclosure Gen 2. We've had a high performance flash enclosure before. Now we're migrating to the Gen 2 version of this. And this is probably the major thing uh, that's part of this release that we're going to talk about. So I'll show you a little more on that in another slide. Then provisioning for Z system volumes. We've had been provisioning, of course, for open for some time. Now we've had it now for Z for a few releases. But what we're doing now is a, an allowing space release for uh, account key data volumes by using certain utilities in, in the Z operating system. This, the IBM uh, Storage Manager GUI for the DS8000 greatly improved. Jason is, is the guy leading that particular charge. We'll turn it over to him here in a few minutes to take a look at that. Uh, it has FICON extended distances for things like uh, ZOS Global Mirror, more properly known as XRC. We're going to be able to get much faster initial copies. Some of the other subsystems in here, such as DFSMS, DSS, and DB2, and other things using FICON here as well are going to be enhanced with that. Now, one of the other really important things in here is that we're now going to be using RAID 6 as our default mechanism for protecting data inside the DS8000. Now, the DS8000 is like four different types of things we, we try to optimize. First, we try to optimize for data integrity. Always want to have that data kept safe. That's the most important thing in the world. Then we want to have system reliability. The data's not only got to be there, but it's got to be available. When we, when we have those things in hand, and we do, uh, then we concentrate on performance in the system, and you're going to see great performance out of this. I'll show you a slide on that later. And then features and functions um, on top of all that. But the reason we're going to RAID 6 now as the default is that the workhorse over years has been RAID 5. Now, RAID 5 has been a great scheme, and we've done things like our smart drive rebuild to enhance that. But the problem is drives can keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we don't want customers to be exposed to the possibility of um, losing any data during a drive rebuild if, if a second drive or a sector in a second drive has a problem. So going to slide 9 here, I'm, I'm going to tell you at this point that we're so concerned about this, again, data integrity and system reliability are so important to you that we're going to now have RAID 6 as the default uh, when you create arrays uh, inside the system. And this provides a huge improvement over RAID 5 uh, if you have hard drives failing, second hard drives failing, or sectors failing on other hard drives. So here's a quick look at the family now. There are actually three separate members of the family. They're not upgradable to each other, so they are three completely separate members. We have the 8884, the entry-level system, the 8886, which is the workhorse version, and then the all-flash 8888. And you'll see some huge capacities here, up to 5.2 petabytes with the 8886. Now, let's talk about the high-performance flash enclosure Gen 2. The Gen 1 is shown in the upper left-hand corner of this particular slide. It was a 1U um, container that had up to 30 uh, 1.8-inch cards that fit into it. Now we're moving to a 4U container in here that can have uh, many more cards. We can go up to uh, actually drives in this particular case, or specialized drives. We can go up to 48 drives in this. Uh, you'll notice that the flash options in the 1U version, the Gen 1, 
uh, we're limited to 800 gigabytes as the maximum. Now we're going to 3.2 um, uh, terabytes as the largest drive that we can have. So we have much more capacity available in the system. The other thing that we're doing in here is look at the attachment, which is uh, in the middle of the rows down the left-hand column. We used to have PCI Gen 2. Now we're moving to PCI Gen 3, allowing much faster interconnect into the system. We're not going through the normal cards that would be used for hard drives in the system. That would slow it down. So we have a special connection right into the processors uh, from these I.O. bays. And look at the performance on the bottom, showing the performance of the, the uh, Gen 1 on the left, performance of the Gen 2 on the right, and you look at the huge increase we're getting now uh, out of this system. Okay. Going to slide 12 in this case, I'm showing you with the DS8884 where the high performance uh, flash enclosures um, go. One goes into the base frame on a DS8884, and the second one goes into the second frame. So each has a total of 48 uh, drives that can be put in there for a total of 96 flash cards for the system. If I go to the 8886, I actually have two models now of the 8886. I have a single phase power version and a three phase power version. So this shows the single phase power version. I can have now four of these high performance flash enclosures for a total of 192 flash cards. So you take the 96 that I had before, now I double that, I get up to 192 in this particular case. They're both in the first two frames. And then as you can see, I can also put 1,536 uh, either hard drives or the traditional hard drive form factor solid state drives into the system as well. If I go now on slide 14 to the three phase rack, you'll see in here I still have the same 192 flash cards in the high performance flash enclosure Gen 2 drawers that I have in this system. But since the power connectors in here or the power subsystem in this is slightly larger than what I got with the three phase, I'm a little bit limited on the number of hard drives I can have in here or solid state drives in the hard drive form factor to 1,440. Now I'm going to slide 15 in here. I have a configuration summary in here of, of my um, cores, number of cores on the left-hand side, ranging from six cores of the entry system to 48 cores on the DS8888. Now you'll notice that I did not have a slide showing the layout of the high-performance flash enclosure Gen 2 in the DS8888. And the reason for that is we have not yet announced the high-performance flash enclosure Gen 2 for the DS8888. Watch this space is all I can say. So what this shows in configuration summary then is um, the amount of processor we have, the amount of system memory, which can go up to two terabytes now, uh, and so forth throughout the system. On slide number 16, we're going to show the large capacity increase that we can get in the system going from the Gen 1 models now to the Gen 2 models. I used to be able to have a maximum of 192 terabytes of uh, unformatted capacity in the system. Now I can get up to 614 uh, terabytes of unformatted capacity with the Gen 2 high performance flash enclosure. So a lot bigger and as we saw on the last slide, a lot faster. So now this shows, um, this is just a, a little slide to whet your appetite here a little bit, showing you the huge performance and the great latency that we can get with the DS8880 system. So the two curves in the upper left-hand corner are both with hard drives only on prior models of the system, the 8880 in yellow and the 8870 in the pinkish color, and all of the great performance, very low latency on the bottom is using the new DS8880. Now, the astute here and sharp-eyed will notice, hey, wait a minute, I'm using multiples of flash cards here that do not look like the multiples that you told me before with the high-performance flash enclosure Gen 2. You're right. These measurements here are with the high-performance flash enclosure Gen 1. I'm going to talk here in a couple more slides about where you're going to see the new performance charts with the high-performance flash enclosure Gen 2, which are not done yet, but they are coming very soon. Okay. So to summarize here with the DS8880, um, we have the ability to provide great integration with the System Z, great in integration with the power system. But by the way, not limited to that, we have lots and lots and lots of customers out there that are using other types of processors to hook to it, x86 and Solaris and all these other things. 
so that um, if you want the absolute best performance with the greatest reliability and the most feature function in terms of remote replication and other things like that, um, the 8880 is the right thing. And we're just going to fit it into various categories here, cognitive, business analytics, um, using it as a cloud system, and I.O. intensive. And to give some specific examples here on slide 19, there's a health institution working with IBM Watson on, the, on a DS8000. The lower left-hand corner, business analytics. We have customers with the energy, in this particular case, an energy corporation using SAP. On the upper right-hand corner, the health institution using um, our IBM Smart Cloud uh, product here to turn the DS8000 storage into cloud-like storage. And IO Intensitive, um, again, another SAP kind of application for a company in Germany. So that's really a quick overview of what we've done in Release 8.2 in the DS8880. Now, there's going to be another presentation coming up December 13th, again, with Brian Sherman on it as well, and some other folks. Uh, Jason Peopleman is also going to be on it. He's the person that's going to be doing the demo here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, a gentleman named David Valverde from the Tucson Performance Lab, and then three folks from the Washington System Storage Team. You'll notice this is on December 13th. You have to register for the session. When you download the presentation or get the presentation, you can go through and uh, do a reservation for that. That will give you much more detail on the Release 8.2 and updated performance charts for that, showing the high-performance flash enclosure Gen 2. And lastly, I want to finish here by saying that uh, if those types of deep dives on various storage technology kind of things are, are your thing, uh, which they should be, this is great stuff, uh, you'll see in the lower right-hand corner, not only do we have the 8880 technical update coming on the 13th, but there are actually two other presentations coming between now and year-end, one on the TS7700 grid replication, and then on the 30th of this month, how FLAPE, which is flash plus tape, uh, gives you great value um, and you know, speed and, and also a great cost reduction as well. So with that, I'm going to conclude my portion of this presentation, and I'm going to turn it over now to Jason Peopleman, who's going to take you through the GUI interface to show you exactly how that works and the great changes we made there. Excellent. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jack. That was great. Um, I'm going to be taking you through... Um, kind of a modified version of what I normally go through. If you've seen me present before, uh, you know I normally take people through either the changes that we've gone through uh, with our user interfaces, or I take you through a demo. What I'm going to try this time is I'm going to take you through a demo of our user interface. And if you've been through a demo of our user interface before, that's okay, because I'll be highlighting the release 8.2 changes as we go through. So really pointing out what has changed in the last release. So either way, if you've seen this before or if you haven't, this should be very valuable to you. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was I just wanted to go over some of the things that we do. First of all, yeah, my name is Jason Peifelman. Um, I'm the design lead for DS8000 and CS4500. I'm also a user experience architect for all of our products, including our, our Flash products, our Storewise products, and uh, XIV as well. I do a lot of user research in that area. So if you've heard me before, you've heard me um, say this mantra over and over. Our goal of designing user interfaces and the products in general is speed, simplicity, and commonality in that order. They have to be fast, easy to use, and common with our other products. So as I take you through there, I, I, will, I will show you how we've made it that way. There have been lots of reviews with many customers here. Um, I wanted to point out that if anyone wants an extended version of this demo or wants to talk to me about your experience with our user interfaces, you can contact me. Um, you can contact Jack. Jack Arnold will set it up and set up an appointment for us to talk. And I could either take you through advanced functions and advanced ways of using the GUI so that you guys are more efficient. And I would love feedback from you guys as far as um, your experience with it and any improvements we can make to help you guys out and make your job easier. So as we go through here, um, I have a history of kind of the stuff that we did to the GUI. It was the new user interface for DS8000 was introduced in release 7.4. Uh, when we did that, it took the place of the old GUI. We left the old GUI in there, but we added system health monitoring, configuration, and user access to the first release. This ensured that a user would be able to do whatever they needed as far as the configuration and as far as system health monitoring. I'll be taking you through the details of those as we go through. In 7.5, we added performance monitoring, which was, uh, which was great and very well received. 
Um, you can get one week of performance statistic at one minute intervals for the DS8000 and view that on the GUI itself. Simplified encryption support, so we introduced encryption as well as introducing uh, mini system settings that we didn't have in our first release so that it was a complete release and that you, you guys had everything you needed to um, configure the system as you did before. In release 8.0, it was mainly a hardware release, so, but there were effectively usability improvements there that I wanted to point out, which was the 19-inch rack, of course, and the full dual HMC support, and the faster processor that we introduced as well. In 8.1, we introduced host cluster uh, support. This um, moved us forward in the way we handle open system designs. As uh, some of you know, we switched to a more um, host-based uh, interface here rather than saying volume groups and host connects. It's more hosts, host ports, and you map the volumes directly to the hosts. Um, as part of that, in 8.1, we introduced the idea of host clustering so that you can group hosts together and just map your volumes to the cluster. That way they're mapped identically to all the hosts underneath. So that was a major usability improvement on top of the store-wise design that we effectively inherited as well. Encryption support was introduced, and of course the CKD thread provisioning that uh, uh, Jack alluded to earlier. So that brings us up to 8.2. Our three hills for 8.2, hills are the major things that we work on, includes support improvements. So we're changed how you guys interact with our service organization in order to make sure that that is a fa fast and easy way to diagnose problems and fix and repair any issues that you may find. Simplified host configuration. This is, this is to make it even easier to convert your system over to the new way of host thinking that we have. And uh, some security updates, which we also introduced. So without any further ado, I'd like to switch over and just start presenting um, what we have here as far as our user interface. So the first thing I'll point out, this is the DSA 1000 user interface. I will be going on a live system here and typing it out. So uh, this is one of our development systems and we will be configuring this system. We'll be looking at all the uh, management of the system. Um, I'm going to show you that one of the goals we had originally was to configure the system within an hour of getting it set up. Um, I'm going to do that as part of this presentation within the half an hour that I have. So uh, you can do it very quickly to get it ready for I.O. and configured. And I'll be doing that for both open systems and system Z. So to start with, um, the URL of the uh, user interface that you get to is simply the URL of the HMC. So in this case, we have this system that I'll be logging into. That takes you directly to the user interface. If you need to get to the service GUI, there's a link to that in the bottom left that you can get to. If you're used to this interface, I'll go back to commonality again. You can use any of our other user interfaces, or if you've used any of our other user interfaces, you could switch over to DSAK very, very seamlessly. For example, if I switch over to our StoreWise interface, this is the StoreWise V7000. I can click over here. This is the Flash System 900. Clicking over here, this is our Tate product. So you can see they're all the same login page. If you logged into these systems and used them, as well as SAN Volume Controller, if you're using that in front of the DS8000, it's a very similar user experience that you'll go through. That's because the design team really talked to each other and we shared members of the design team between the different products as these were developed to try to ensure that you had a smooth transition between the products because we know many of you are actually managing more than one product type. So let's go ahead and log in. So the first thing I wanted to show was kind of what you would see when you first logged in for the very first time uh, if the service guy handed you the keys to the system and you were to open it up. If you were to open it up and this was the first time you logged into the system, you would see the system setup wizard. It would guide you through a setup process where you enter the system name. In this case, we'll call it demo. And then the license functions. So you got to set up, you have to set up the license functions in order to access the advanced function features. You would open the active, activate license functions page. And if you didn't know how it works, all of our pages have a little get more help on the bottom left-hand side here uh, if it's needed. In this case, it tells you which website to go to and it even gives you system-specific information that you would enter in that website. In this case, uh, this is a development machine, so I'm going to skip this step and just go on. You can rename the system yourself manually. The system is now renamed to demo. You can see that on the top left in the banner area. 
Um, other things that you would do when you logged in as well would be possibly running a CLI script. So if the uh, sales team that you're working with, or if you've set up a DS8000 in the past and have a CLI script already set up to apply the configuration or anything else you need, we have an embedded CLI. And this is new as of 8.2. So this is the first 8.2 only feature that I'm showing you. It's a fully um, capable DS CLI. The only function that doesn't support is the ability to import or export files to and from the system. That's because the CLI you're using is actually running on the system itself. Because it's running on the system itself, it's guaranteed to be up to date um, and the correct level for the system you're currently on. If you want to run your scripts, you would uh, click the open button over here to select your script file. You would click open. It would run the script within this embedded CLI and run to completion. If you have a full system setup script, you're now done. The configuration of your box is now complete. If you don't, the, the setup is goes through still very quickly. So the next thing you may want to do as part of system setup is go into your fiber channel ports and configure them. So modify the protocol to set it to FICON or SCSI FCP. One thing we did add in 8.2 was if you try to modify the protocol of an already existing I.O. port on your system from FICON to SCSI FCP or the other way around, we will give you a warning to make sure that you know that that will interfere with I.O. The other thing you might want to do is go into the system and modify the EV tier settings. So let's say you wanted to set it to automatic mode and monitor mode both set to all. So everything, not just the tiered pools, are being managed. Go ahead and save that. And that takes you through kind of what we do for our system setup. At this point, you, you have a system that's ready to be configured as far as the logical configuration of the system goes. You're now free to create um, any pool configurations or volume configurations, and I'll walk you through that as well. Before we jump into that, though, I'd like to show you some of the monitoring capabilities of the system. You probably saw this when I first logged in. There is a picture of the box over here on the right. It, it, you can interact with this picture. You can look at the storage enclosures on it. You can even see that we have some of the new high-performance flash enclosures that Jack was talking about earlier. You can tell they're high-performance flash enclosures because they're 800 gigabyte flash drives. I can zoom in a little more so you can see that a little easier. For those uh, flash drives, we have those new PCIe Gen 3 uh, cards that he was talking about. Uh, the interfaces for those don't go through the normal uh, DA cards, the device adapter cards that you're used to. Instead, uh, you can see right here they go into another connection at the bottom, which leaves it a bit, a bit less cluttered as far as um, these I.O. enclosures. Uh, so that you could really focus on your host adapters, so that's even better there. You can also get information about your nodes, your power supplies, your HMCs, all your hardware components on here. If you have more than one um, frame, you'll be able to access the views for those frames just by clicking through it. And if there's any problems with those, we will uh, alert you to exactly what's failing on this. So I brought you to a different system so you can see how some are highlighted yellow, and some, even if you zoomed in, will be highlighted red if they're completely offline. In those cases as well, you'll see at the bottom here that our system health pod at the bottom right turned yellow. It says the system is in a service required state. And you can see there's alerts here. These alerts take you to the events page. Let's talk about events a little bit. Events include everything that's ever happened to the system. For example, you can see here that the system was renamed to demo and the easy tier mode was updated as well. So you can see the two things I just did during this demo while we were doing it. Anything. You can see the states of the drives going online, offline. You can see pools being deleted, drives being initialized. Any system state change that happens on the system is reported through this. And as of release 8.2, any of this information can be reported to a syslog server if you configure one. Under notifications, there are syslog servers, and you can add syslog servers uh, to be configured this way. That means that we'll send those events whenever they happen over to your syslog servers. You can filter them as you want. You can attach SSB traps on the syslog server side. Um, you can attach email notifications or many, many different things that different syslog servers support. So very handy there. The only thing that's not passed via our events page today are copy services events. So you won't see any information about your copy services relationships. And throughout the GUI, you will not use this GUI to manage copy services. You will use 
the copy services manager to manage your copy services or GDPS on the system Z side. All right, that's events. Now we'll go talk about some of the serviceability options that we've also added. I wanted to port, point out some of the things that are on this page. On the top left here, you'll notice there's a save icon there. There's two things you could do. You could export a system summary, or you can export, oops, that was or you can export a performance summary. So both of these are very useful. The system summary includes all the information about any of the hardware on your system, the system state itself, the functional switches you have, the license keys that you have, any volumes that you've configured, any pools that you've configured, hosts that you've configured, anything regarding the physical or logical configuration of the system will be printed here. The only thing that's not included, again, is copy services in this list and the events list. So the events list itself can be thousands of entries long. So in order to export that, you would go to the events page itself and you would be able to export that here along with the audit log if you so choose. So lots of information that you could export in order to help you out. Not only does this help uh, a lot of our customers to do audit, uh, auditing on their side, so they get the serial numbers of all their hardware components, they get the current state of their system at different times, so they could diff this file from one month to another month. But it also helps them uh, deal with support a lot as well. If you're dealing with support and they want to know the current state of the system, they could look at these files, particularly the, the performance summary file, which will give uh, our support team the ability to not have to uh, have you run a, a performance anal analysis utility on your system and recreate the problem. Instead, they'll be able to get the last week worth of performance information and then help you diagnose whatever issues you're having that way as well. Other offload things that we support, we, we do include uh, offloading support packages via the DSCLI. That was new as of 8.2. And you could access all that functionality via the embedded DSCLI here. And that's the offload. Um, the, the other things that we support as well are CSM installed, which is new and supported via the DSCLI. So just to mention some of the DSCLI only functions that we support in 8.2. And enabling or disabling the remote uh, service center or AOS is also a part of that. So you can enable or disable the session to allow service to log into your system uh, remotely so that they can help you out as well. That all can be done via the CLI as well without having to go to different interfaces or different places to do it. So it's a one-stop shop. We want you to be able to get everything done here. When you're on the phone with service and they want you to do something, often they'll give it to you in the form of a CLI command. So you'll enter it here and hit enter. Tell them what the output was, you're good to go. All right, so let's continue on with the uh, configuration example that I had before, just so we can get through that. So really fast, I'll go through and we'll look at the arrays by pools. So you can see the navigation on the left-hand side here. You have monitoring, which lets you see the system, events, and performance. These are the pools that you look at, volumes, the hosts, and the user accounts. And then there's uh, settings as well where you see all the different settings for your system as well. So let's go through and first look at the pools. So if I, if I just go straight over to volumes, you'll see I can't create volumes here. And anytime we disable something, we're going to tell you why. So this says no pools created, please create the pools first. So we'll go ahead and go over to pools. Create pool pair. And in this case, we're going to create an uh, FB pool pair. We're going to create it called AIX. And I, I'm going to create this pool kind of small since this is a demo and we wanted to get it done fast. So you'll notice that the only inputs I have in here are the name prefix of the two pools that I'm going to create and how many arrays of each type I want in there. I could either put my flash arrays in there or my enterprise 15K arrays in there. When I do this, the reason that it's creating two pool pairs is because we have pool node affinity. That means each pool is managed by a particular processor node on our system. We have two processor nodes. So to balance the workload over the two processor nodes, you have to create two pools. The GUI is going to help you with this balancing throughout the entire process. That's why you don't have to worry about creating one and then the other and knowing that you have to do that. The GUI is going to help you just create two right off the bat. And it will also help you balance the capacity over those two pools as well as you fill them with volumes. If you wanted to get some more custom options here, this is where you can go to the advanced custom options, where you could set the RAID type if you wanted that to be different or the extent size. Now, if you set the RAID type as of release 8.2, we will give you a warning 
that talks about not wanting to set the RAID type to anything but RAID 6 for the same reasons that Jack pointed out previously. So in this case, we don't want to do that. We're going to want to use RAID 6. But if we just go to the basic preset over here for a uh, fixed block and create our pools, that will use the base default and the base extent size. So we'll just go ahead and do that. Now while this completes, you might notice that I didn't say anything about array sites, ranks, or arrays. I was just talking about two objects, really. I was talking about arrays and pools. That's it. The arrays I'm talking about are a set of eight disks. So you take this set of eight disks that we call an array and you assign it to a pool. That gives the pool capacity so you can create uh, volumes out of the pool. That's it. That's the way it works. Um, so we, we greatly simplified the paradigm that you used in order to configure the box. And we did this so that it's much more straightforward and we don't have a lot of objects that you have to juggle or a lot of concepts that you have to keep track of in your head. Um, this is one of the reasons why we're really pushing forward now our configuration process is fewer steps than V7000 um, and fewer concepts, fewer clicks than SVC. It really is quite a simplified system to use to configure the DS8000. Um, so as we go through here, uh, you'll be able to notice that. Most of our customers, 50% of them, are going to have two pools. Um, so after this step, they're going to create their pool pair. They're going to assign all the arrays to it. They click create. That's the only thing they have to do for pool pair creation. If they have more than one, they're going to do it like I'm doing more than one pair of pools. They're going to be doing it the way I'm going to be doing it here, which is to finish creating the first pool pair, and then I'm going to create the second pool pair and assign even more arrays to that. When you assign these arrays, the user interface is going to be very intelligent about it. You don't have to worry about DA pair balancing. You don't have to worry about balancing the spares between the pools, any of the stuff that you had to worry about before if you knew about that stuff. The system is going to do all that balancing for you and it will give you a configuration based on our recommendations. So it will have the DA pairs balanced so you'll get proper performance out of your processor nodes as well as the spares balanced so that you get equal capacity on both pools being configured. So this is just finishing up, creating this, those two pools for me. As you can see, whenever it executes something, you can see it happening in the background here. If you want to view more details about what it's doing, you can do that and see it in the progress dialog. But if you keep the view more details collapsed, um, this progress dialog will automatically close and get out of your way. If you have the view more details opened, when it finishes, it will tell you it's completed and then allow you to close it because it will assume that you're um, waiting to see what happened. So a little advanced tip, most of the time when I'm using this, I keep it closed because I like for it to close and get out of my way so that I can move on to the next step quickly. So the last step in this process after it creates both pools is to assign the arrays to them. Now when it's assigning the arrays, it's taking care of all the legacy stuff that you had to worry about before, including uh, configuring the array site, uh, creating the array for the RAID type, and the rank for uh, the storage type as well. So all of that's being taken care of for you. For very large configs, this can take quite a while since it's um, about a minute to two minutes per array when you assign them to do all that configuration and formatting. So this is one of the steps that if I have a large system that I'm configuring, I usually kick it off, go to lunch, come back, it's all complete, and I continue on my volume creation. So in that case, both of these pools were created. So I'm going to go ahead and create another pool pair for CKD here, and I'll call this my CKD pool pair, and I'll give it two flash drives as well. So I'll go ahead and kick this create off so it starts. Now, we don't want to have to wait for this again, right? I want to go do stuff while this is working because I want to go create that FB configuration that we were talking about. How would I go do that now? Well, I could right-click up here and duplicate this tab. This is using the browser's duplicate tab. I'm in Chrome. That's what I prefer to use when I'm uh, using this interface. But you can right-click on a tab up here and duplicate it. That brings you to the same GUI. So, or you can open another browser and browse to the same user interface or the same HMC that you were at before. And you can see that the action is still happening in the background, but I don't have to worry about it, and I'm free to do other actions. So we'll go ahead and go into the volumes page. And you can see that I can now create volumes. 
So I'll go ahead and click Create Volumes. In this case, the CKD pools are still being created, so we can't create CKD volumes yet. But we try and create FB volumes. So the FB volumes is very easy. Um, it's going. It just simply asks us to name the pre, the volumes. I'm going to call these AIX. I want four volumes. And in this case, uh, these are going to be in gigabytes. Sorry, we were doing some IBMI stuff beforehand. And each one of them is going to have a capacity of 100 gigabytes. Let's say. That's it. The name prefix, the quantity, and the capacity. You can also optionally select a host or cluster to assign it to or to map it to at this time. In this case, I'm not going to. I'm just going to create these because I haven't set up my hosts yet. So go ahead and click Create, and it will start creating these as well. Boom. So there we go. Four volumes were just created. So I have these all now, and they're my FB configuration. The next thing for an FB configuration would be to create the hosts. Now, one of the things that I did here to show you guys what you can do here in 8.2 is I went ahead and created some hosts already. Whenever you've created hosts with the old GUI or with the CLI, we need to learn more about them with this GUI. Um, the reason is our old architecture didn't necessarily remember which host each host port was created for. So you would create host connection objects, which are WWPNs, and volume groups, which were sets of volumes that you mapped to those host connection objects. Well, the host connection objects wouldn't know what host they belong to, so you would see a list of 64 host connections, and you wouldn't necessarily know if those were to eight different hosts, 16 different hosts, one host. You weren't sure how it was configured, and if you saw six host connections that were offline at that point, is one of your hosts offline? Or are those redundant? You wouldn't necessarily know that. So to, to fix this problem, we introduced the concept of a host. And each host has a set of host ports. So when you go into this configuration at first and you're creating stuff, you'd create a host, you'd add the host ports to it, and you'd tell us what type of host it was. So if you created a host called My Windows Host and created four WWPNs inside of that, it would have four host ports, and you'd be done. We'd know what host ports belong to it. Then you can map volumes directly to that host. But in this case, because we already set it up using the CLI and we didn't give it the information about which host those WWPNs belong to, we have to configure that ourselves. Now in 8.2, we made this process a lot easier. Because in, previous process, in, in the previous versions of the GUI, we would just ask you to tell us which host each WWPN belonged to, and we wouldn't give you much help with that. Now, I'll, I can see I have three hosts based on the detected configuration. So, the configuration that I have currently, it says it found three hosts. Or I can manually create the hosts myself and assign them directly. So if I click on manual, you can see what I have here already, which is there are already five hosts, I'm sorry, six host connects already created. Four to this thing called legacy host underscore zero, and two to this host called AIX1776. Well, in this case, I want to go ahead and see if I can automatically create these hosts. So let's go ahead and click that and see what happens. Well, the legacy host here was created with the legacy GUI. That means it was created back using the old GUI that does kind of have a concept of hosts. So when that old GUI tries to do it, it leaves certain markers in there that we can pick up on and just confirm with you that this is what you wanted. But these other two hosts were clearly created by someone else, so we're just guessing. We say, hey, there's two that I couldn't assign to each other, so I just left them out there and gave them unique host names. So in this case, we don't want to create these two. And we'll just go ahead and automatically create that legacy host with those five. So that sets up that host. You're good to go. If you use the legacy GUI to configure your entire system before, um, this will be a very fast process for you. You just confirm that all of the hosts we've detected are correct, and you're done. But in this case, we're going to go ahead and do one last thing, which is manually create the host for these last ones. I'll go ahead and highlight them create a host for them. It goes ahead and populates this field with AIX 1776 for me. I'll create it. There we go. The host is created. I'm all done. I can go into my GUI now, and I see that I have two standalone hosts that are both properly configured with the correct host ports. So again, this is going to be a very fast process for you when uh, you're converting configurations so that when you log into the GUI, you'll be able to solve that problem very quickly. So let's go ahead and uh, map some volumes that we just created. So I'll go to Volumes by Host. 
you can see I have my four volumes here. So let's go ahead and map it to a host or cluster. And in this case, we want to map it all to, let's say, AIX 1776. Done. So I can go in here and see that my, all my volumes were mapped over here as well. At this point, if I had IO, uh, if I had AIX 1776, I would rediscover my LUNs. I would see the new LUNs, and I'd be able to do IO to them right now. So at this point, my FB configuration is complete. So the next thing I want to show you was a quick CKE configuration. If I check my pools over here, my CKE pools were created. Uh, they look great. They're ready to go. Um, I can go into my volumes page over here or and go to volumes by LSS. Now, why do I go to volumes by LSS? Well, because I need to create the LSSs for my uh, system Z volumes first. So I go ahead and create a CKE LSS. I'm going to choose a rather small range. So just four LSSs. I'll go ahead and create those four LSSs. LSSs, LCUs, um, it's the same thing to us. You see two LSSs were already created. Those are the ones that the FB volumes were in. I didn't have to choose it. The system just went ahead and assigned those directly to the LSSs manually. If you look in here, I could say what pool these are in. So you can see that the volumes were spread between the two different pools. So Two of the volumes were created in AIX0 and two of the volumes in AIX1. So you can see that we did balance over those two pools automatically for you. So let's go ahead and create our volumes here. In this case, I like to select the LSSs I want to create the volumes inside of. Right click and say create volumes. And in this case, it'll be a fairly fast configuration. So uh, oftentimes you have a utility volume and you have one of them and it's a mod one. And then you can create another volume. Let's say these are my mod nines. And I want 10 of them. So you can see up here the two pools that it's going to go into, CKD2 and CKD3. You can see the amount of space it's going to take in there. And we'll go ahead and create these volumes. So let's create a few less of these. Let's create a four. Wait, we're not waiting for all the increase all day. Go ahead and create. And you can see the volumes creating uh, on each one. When I did this, I said how many volumes I wanted per LSS. So I created one utility volume and four mod nines per LSS. Every LSS that I had selected, which there are four of them, will have one utility volume and four mod nine volumes created in it to keep the configuration the same. If you have different configurations on your LSS, that's fine. You just select one LSS at a time. You configure each one separately. This is just to help in those configurations where everything is exactly the same. So after that's all done, oops, sorry, still completing. Got a few more volumes to create uh, when we created all the utility volumes. And now it's creating the sets of four volumes each. So that should finish a lot faster. Here we go through. The final process of creating a system Z config would be to create your alias volumes or your PAV volumes in there. Now in the GUI, instead of creating them as volumes, we just allow you to right click on the LSS itself and say modify aliases. You enter the number of aliases you want per LSS. In this case, I want two per alias. Let's say I want one. And I go ahead and click modify. So boom, 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 boom. It just created all my alias volumes. Now on this page, I can see I have five volumes, one alias, and my SSID is 8110 uh, for this um, LSS. I'm able to take this information and any other information that I have inside of this page, send it over to my System Z administrator, or if I'm the System Z administrator, I log into System Z and enter it on the hardware definition console. They input all this information, and you're up and running with I.O. running to your CKD volumes as well. So that was it. That was configuration for both open and FB done um, in about 10 minutes. I think I got that done in. The last thing that I want to show you is just a few more miscellaneous things that we added um, to 8.2. And the first one that I wanted to show you was the ability to delete pools, even if they have volumes in them. 
So you can see that I can select my two CKD pools and delete those if I wanted to. Now I would have to confirm this and I could force the deletion. The reason I have to do that is because it is going to delete the volumes on the other side of these pools for me. But if you're one of those people who like to clean up the configuration of your system regularly, uh, or you need to transfer it to a new department and it needs to be wiped cleared of its configuration, this makes that a lot faster. We do have a number of customers who do that regularly. All right, the last thing I wanted to show was just a glance at our performance reporting, because if you haven't seen it before, uh, it's worth noting what we can do and where you can get at it. So again, I want under monitoring performance, I can open up this on the left-hand side, which is the objects and metrics view. To select which resource type I want to see, I can choose between system, array, pool, and I.O. port. I can select my different resources and then select what type of metric I want to see for it. So in this case, IOPS, latency, transfer size, bandwidth, I'm looking at the total IOPS for these four uh, I.O. ports. Now on the system, because I just created everything and I didn't have I.O. running before, um, there's no history of I.O. running on this system. But you can scroll through the history. We do keep up to one week of data that you can view. And it is all at one minute intervals, so you can see through that as you go. You could also split this if you wanted to say, have one chart looking at the total IOPS and then the other chart at the bottom instead looking at the latency. So you can compare one latency chart against the IOPS charts that's above. So this is latency on the bottom, IOPS on the top. We also allow exporting uh, each individual uh, one or saving this as a favorite so you can save them on the left-hand side here and get to them quickly if you ever need them again. All right. Well, with, after going through all of that, um, I'd love to open it up for questions. So, Jack, I think we can open it up for questions now if you're ready. Sure. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian at this point and uh, let Brian uh, see if there are any questions of uh, general uh, interest that should be answered. Sure. Thanks, Jack. And we have, did have one come in, Jason. It was, can you label the CKD volumes from the GUI as well? That's a great question. When you create your CKD volumes in the GUI, you do define what the name prefix of the volume is, like I labeled some of mine util, but this only shows up on the DS8000 side. So this is information so you can find it faster on the DSAK. Uh, that name prefix won't be transferred to the system Z side. Instead, you'll be using the vaults here, which you can also view. So I'll go ahead and add that as a column here. There's the vaults here, and that's set by the system Z host, so you can see what the vaults here is and kind of match that to what you called it versus what's in the system itself. I hope that helps. Yeah, Sam, maybe you can give Jason back control just so we can see what Jason was just showing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure thing. I forgot I wasn't showing. All right. <laughs> there we go. That looks better. So um, I was on the volumes page. Uh, so on the volumes page, you can view all your volumes, including your um, open system volumes and all your system Z volumes. But one of the things you could do is you could right click on the top up here and show additional columns. The one I was showing was false here. So that'll help you see the vaults here that System Z gave it and the information that you have of the um, name prefix that you gave it when you created the volume. And if you want to ever want to change those name prefixes, you can do that as well via the rename action. So. All right. Great. Uh, that helped. If you have any follow-on or anything, Peter, let, 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 let us know. Um, but, but I think uh, we, we covered that off. That, that was the only other other question that we, we kind of had outstanding. I don't know, Jack or, or Raul or, or Jason, if there's anything else that you want to uh, kind of comment on. We've got a couple minutes, or if not, then we can turn it back over to Sam. Yeah, this is Jack. So thank you very much, Jason, for that uh, excellent presentation of the GUI. Brian, thank you very much for your help here with the, the question and answer. And so um, in summary here then, uh, we came out with this uh, DS8880 release 8.2 on November 2nd. Uh, we are just now uh, doing this uh, discussion here today to, to do sort of an initial view of it. 
If you want more information, I want to again point out that on December the 13th, we have the deep dive DS8880 technical update that you get to through the Accelerate with IBM Storage webinars that uh, come at the end of the presentation. And Brian Sherman will be on that as one of the presenters. And so that will take you to deep dive into more of the aspects of it in more detail and also some more of the um, performance information, which is still being worked on. So with that, uh, Brian, Jason, any other comments here before we close it up? Just a reminder that if anyone wants to meet up and uh, discuss their experience with the user interface, they can contact you, Jack. That's right. And my uh, user ID, my email user ID, is on the front page of my presentation. Uh, it is JGA, Juliet Golf Alpha, at us.ibm.com. Please feel free to drop me a note, and I will put you in touch with Jason, and we'll be able to uh, have then an uh, individualized presentation for you, if you like, of the GUI uh, over, the, over a web conference. So with that, Sam, thanks very much to everybody for their help with this uh, meeting today, and we'll turn it back to you. Thanks a lot, Jack, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Brian, for uh, sharing all your guys' insight and uh, going through this presentation and demo, demo today. So I uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. Please do take a few moments to fill out your post-event survey. We love hearing everyone's feedback and use it for future events. But this does conclude today's call. Have a wonderful